Greetings. Get out your King James Bible. Turn to Isaiah chapter 28. This is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Just a little background information. Ephraim was the of the half-tribe of Joseph, along with his brother Manasseh. They were essentially the 12th and 13th tribe of Israel. And when Israel split from Judah, the southern kingdom of Judah, whose capital was Jerusalem, the northern capital of Israel was Samaria. And Ephraim was the main or chief tribe. I guess they were the most numerous, and hence they were considered the chief tribe. So, in Jeremiah 3 and verse 8, God divorced northern Israel, but he did not divorce southern Judah. So, Judah's capital, again, was Jerusalem, and northern Israel, Israel's capital was Samaria, of which Ephraim was the chief tribe. So keep that in mind. Uh, Israel and Ephraim went into apostasy before Judah did. And they were invaded by the Assyrian Empire and taken over and taken into captivity. So with that in mind, Isaiah 28, verse 1. Woe to the crown of pride. Now, one thing the Lord does not particularly care for, and I'm being sarcastic here, is pride. That's one thing I'm not guilty of. I'm guilty of a lot of other things, but that's pride is not one of them. Woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim. Were they drunk with wine? Or they were they drunk from drinking the wine of fornication spiritually? Or is it both? Woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is as a fading flower, which are on the head of the fat valleys of them that are overcome with wine. Behold, the Lord hath a mighty and strong one, which is, uh, which as a tempest of hail and a destroying storm, as a flood of mighty waters overflowing, shall cast down to the earth with the hand. The crown of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim, shall be trodden under foot, feet. And the glorious beauty which is on the head of the fat valley, shall be a fading flower. And as the hasty fruit before the summer, which when he looketh upon it, seeth, while it is yet in his hand, he eateth it up. In that day shall the Lord of hosts be for a crown of glory and for a diadem of beauty unto the residue of his people. Now, residue is kind of a synonym for remnant. Because let's face it, people, only a remnant of the Lord's people are going to actually come to the Lord. Verse 6. And for a spirit of judgment to him that sitteth in judgment, and for strength to him that turn the battle to the gate. But they also have erred through wine. And through strong drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. For all tables are full of vomit and filthiness, so that there is no place clean. I'll tell you what, uh, I don't know, a lot of people I know that go to church, 
and some of them are self-righteous, some of them are not, will tell you, oh, well, liquor has never touched my lips. Well, that's good. But liquor has touched my lips. And I know what happens when I drank too much. You vomit. And it's filthy. And that's what this is referring to. It says, so that there is no place clean. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? See, people, doctrine is important. I've had Baptist churches tell me, oh, you know, doctrine's not important. Yes, it is. They just don't have any understanding or they're deceivers. Ah, and I always go to the Baptists because I went to one of their Bible colleges and, you know, I know their, their heresies. So, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Now, let's do a little bit on doctrine here. In Deuteronomy 32, verse 2, the Lord says, My doctrine, my doctrine, shall drop as the rain. My speech shall distill as the dew, as the smallest rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. Job 11, 4. For thou hast said, My doctrine is pure, and I am clean in thine eyes. Proverbs 4, 2. For I give you good doctrine, forsake ye not my law. And then there, that's good doctrine, right? And then in Matthew 15, 9, Jesus said this about bad doctrine. But in vain, and what does vain mean? It means worthless. But in vain they do worship me teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. You want the commandments of men or do you want the commandments of God? Now, in... Let's see, in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus was talking to the disciples. And then in verse 6, he said, Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Now, who are the Pharisees and the Sadducees? They were denominations of Jews. I mean, they're, Jew they're both Jews, but they're different denominations, just like you've got Baptists, Lutherans, Presbyterians, you know, so, so take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the doctrine, uh, Sadducees. And they, the disciples, and they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. Which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves, because ye have brought no bread? Do ye not yet understand, neither remember the five loaves of the five thousand and how many baskets ye took up? Neither the seven loaves of the four thousand and how many baskets ye took up? How is it that ye do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning bread, that ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees? Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. So evidently, Jesus didn't like the doctrines of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. In 1 Timothy 4 and verse 1, now the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, or the last days, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and 
doctrines of devils. So you've got the doctrines of the Lord. You've got the doctrines of Christ, which is the Lord. You've got the doctrines uh, and commandments of men, and you've got doctrines of devils. So doctrine is important. 2 John 1 9, whosoever transgresseth, transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine, the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. In 2 John 1 10, if there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. So, why are they letting rabbis into the church? Why? Why are they doing that? Do they have the doctrine of Christ? No. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. For him that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. Godspeed, what is that? Oh, when you say God bless you, that's bidding somebody Godspeed. So, in Revelation 2.15, So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Do you know there's a doctrine that God hates? Oh, yeah. In 1 Timothy 4.16, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. You see, doctrine is important. And 2 Timothy 3, 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof. What's reproof? Uh, well, when you reprove somebody, you are exposing them. For reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. All right, so let's go back to Isaiah 28 and verse 9. Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them, them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. Now, people have criticized me because, you know, I believe my spiritual gift is that of a teacher. And they say, well, Bob, you don't, you, you're, you're not doing the work of an evangelist. Well, I'm not an evangelist. An evangelist takes a non-believer and turns them into a believer. But when they do that, they're babies. And babies have to be breastfed with milk. But there comes a point when the baby has to be weaned from the mil meat, uh, milk and go to the meat. And that's the problem in the church today. Everybody is getting skim milk that's watered down. They never graduate to the meat. I mean, the extent of their doctrine is John 3.16. For God so loved the world. That's it. That's the extent of their doctrine. God loves everybody. The Bible teaches that God has enemies and they want you to cast your pearls before swine when Jesus told you not to do that. So, verse 10. For a precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. And that's how you learn. You learn a little here, you learn a little there. I mean, I've been spending 30 years um, 
since the Lord called me out of darkness, and I've probably been seriously studying for the last, I don't know, uh, on and off, probably 15 out of the last 30 years, maybe 20, you know, I'm telling you, you can get the, the Bible on CD for, you know, the New Testament for like $20, $25 for Amazon. Alexander Scorby, King James Bible on CD for about 25 bucks delivered. Unbelievable. Listen to that for every day on your way to work. You'd be surprised what you'd learn in a, in a year. You'd be real surprised. You can get the whole Bible on CD for probably about 80 bucks, $85, you know. About what it would cost to take a family of four out for dinner. If you could go f go out for dinner with this medical martial law junk. So, verse 11. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to his, to this people. To this people. To whom he said, This is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing yet they would not hear. But the word of the Lord was unto them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. That doesn't sound good, does it? Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men that rule this people which is in Jerusalem. Because ye have said, listen carefully, we have made a covenant with death, and with hell are we at agreement. You see, people, when the Lord made a covenant with a, a covenant with his people, but when they disregarded that covenant and they didn't want that covenant, they made a covenant with death and hell because that's what they wanted. We have made a covenant with death and, he and with hell are we at agreement. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us, for we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. See, they're only fooling themselves. They think that all the bad things are going to bypass them because they've made lies and falsehood their God. Verse 16. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Who is this stone? Huh, let's take a look. I'm real interested. I'm being sarcastic, by the way. In Matthew 21, 42, Jesus saith unto them, did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same is become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. See, when you're laying a foundation and building a house and you got a stone, uh, the first stone that you lay down it's going to be the cornerstone because the walls have to be square because if, if it's cockied, cockeyed one way or the other, the house is not going to be perfectly square. So you got to have the cornerstone is the most important one. It is where all the other stones are going to be laid in a line from off that beginning. The cornerstone's the beginning. In Matthew 21, 44, Jesus said, 
And whosoever shall fall on the stone shall be broken. Now, when you come to this stone, you're going to be broken spiritually if you're the Lord's. But if you reject it, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. In Romans chapter 9 and verse 31, But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone. See, you could either take the stone and build upon it, or you can trip over it. Verse 33, As it is written, I lay in Sion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. In Matthew 11.6, Jesus said, And blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. And then in Romans 9.33, As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Ah, okay. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18, For through him, speaking of Christ, for through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Huh. Maybe I should read that again. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And this is in the book of Ephesians chapter 2. And that was verse 20. Uh, maybe that's why the Judaizers hate Paul. Because Paul identifies Christ as being the chief cornerstone. What do you think? Maybe they would rather have Rabbi Menachem Schneerson be the chief cornerstone since he is their Yeshua, their Savior. Verse 21, In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. I knew there was a reason why they didn't like Paul. Oh, yeah. That makes so much sense, right? All right, let's read. Well, how about Peter? Go to 1 Peter chapter 2. All right, verse 1. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envyings, envies, and all evil speakings. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. And people, that's the purpose of a teacher. An evangelist takes a babe, turns, turns an unbeliever into a believer, into a babe in Christ, and then as they grow, a teacher turns a babe into a soldier. And Lord knows we need more soldiers. A babe, a baby is no good in a battle. I would rather have ten soldiers than a thousand babies. 
Yep, because in a battle, 10 soldiers would be far more valuable than 1,000 babies. Verse 3. If so be, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God, and precious. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore, which believe, he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy. People, if, if there's one Bible study you should do, you should look at my short playlist on You Only Have I Known. In Jeremiah 3.8, God divorced Israel, but not Judah. In Jeremiah 31.31, 31, God said he would make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. In the book of Hosea, God tells Israel, you are not my people. But then in Hosea, later on, he promises them that in the place where they were said not to be his people, that it would be said there that they would become the children of the living God. And I believe that this is what we just read here. And when you look up the word Gentiles and you look up the word nations, in the Hebrew, it's the word goyim. Hebrew, um, in Hebrew, goyim, the King James translator sometimes said nations, sometimes Gentiles. But it's the same word. And in the Greek, that word is ethnos, which is where they get the word for ethnic groups. Ethnos. You'd be surprised how much Greek and Latin are in the English language. Uh, all those medical and pharmaceutical words are from Greek. When you start studying legal terminology, um, that's Latin. I mean, you'd be you'd be surprised how many Latin and Greek words there are in the English language. Of course, there's a lot of German words too. So, but uh, verse ten, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, as abstain from flesh, fleshly lusts, which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, that, um, I'm sorry, 
that they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors, as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. Now, remember something. We're to obey government until the government tells you to disobey the Lord. Uh, I think I'm going to paraphrase it, but it says, The powers that be or are ordained of God. Uh, let's see. 15. For so is the will of God that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free and not using your liberty as a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Boy, that is hard to do when you've got all these ungodly kings running around, right? All right, let's go back and take a look at stones. All right, one more thing and we'll continue with Isaiah. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. What sea? The Red Sea. And were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So here it is, they're talking about crossing the Red Sea with Moses, right? Verse 3. And did all eat the same spiritual meat? What meat was that? The manna in the wilderness, right? Verse 4. And did all drink the same spiritual drink? For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Remember the story of Exodus? Uh, God gave them manna to eat in the wilderness, in the desert, and there was a rock that Moses struck, and it brought forth water. Well, in verse 4 it says, in 1 Corinthians 10, in verse 4, And did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So let's go back to Isaiah 28, verse 16. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. You know what, people? If you've got Christ, you've got a sure foundation. Because let me tell you something. If you build a house on sand, and you put up a lot of heavy walls, and put up a roof, and that sand shifts under the weight the roof comes crashing in on your head, and you're dead. So you want to have a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Verse 17. Judgment also will I lay to the line, and righteousness to the plummet. And the hall shall sweep away the refuge of lies, and the waters shall overflow the hiding place. Verse 18. And your covenant with death shall be disannulled. Ah, when you have the rock, the stone, your covenant with death shall be disannulled. That means it's canceled. And your agreement with hell shall not stand. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, then ye shall be trodden down by it. For the time that it goeth forth, it shall take you. For morning by morning shall it pass over, by day and by night, and it shall be a vexation only to understand the report. For the bed is shorter than that a man can stretch himself on it, and the covering narrower, narrower than that he can wrap himself in it. For the Lord shall rise up as in Mount Perizim, he shall be wroth as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his strange work, and bring to pass his act, his strange act. 
Now therefore, be ye not mockers, lest your bands be made strong. For I have heard from the Lord God of hosts a consumption, even determined upon the whole earth. Give ye ear and hear my voice. Hearken and hear my speech. Doth the plowman plow all day to sow? Doth he open and break the clods of his ground? When he hath made plain the face thereof, doth he not cast abroad the fitches and scatter the cumin, and cast in the principal wheat and the appointed barley and the rye in their place? For his God doth instruct him to discretion and doth teach him. For the fitches are not threshed with a threshing instrument, neither is a cartwheel turned about upon the cumin, but the fitches are beaten out with a staff and the cumin with a rod. Evidently, this is some kind of farming practice that I'm not familiar with, because I'm not a farmer. Verse 28. Bread corn is bruised, because he will not ever be threshing it, nor break it with the wheel of his cart, nor bruise it with his horsemen. This also cometh forth from the Lord of hosts, which is wonderful in counsel and excellent in working. All right, people, that's the end of this Bible study. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and his only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to them and them alone. In Jesus' precious name, amen.